guys are. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me, uh, Ben. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm a little humbled at the audience. There's so many experts uh, among you and, and so many folks that I, I look up to um, as colleagues. So I, I welcome your feedback. So uh, today I want to uh, talk about um, how we can use uh, the results of uh, a lot of the high throughput data coming out on cancer genomes um, to ultimately um, have, a, have a genetic wiring model for patients, uh, for, for individual patient tumors, so we can use those to think about how to target them. And um, the first thing, that, and I guess the, the, the angle I want to take is to think about um, uh, this sort of match and then extend idea, right? So we want to we leverage the, the um, trove of data we have on lots of patients to think about what, what is, you know, this new patient that comes into the clinic, what's the, the, the most similar type of cancer we've seen to this point? And then not ignore the specific nuances we see in that tumor and sort of um, fit the wiring diagram to that patient's tumor once we know sort of the class of tumors it belongs to, right? We want to use the statistical power of the many to inform the, even, even the one case here. That's sort of the angle. And so there's two parts to this, this brief talk. Um, um, first, we have to delineate the, these different subtypes of cancer, the different forms. And um, uh, the, the rough approximation to this is sort of these axes I'm showing here. The, the new TCGA pan cancer project called PanCan Atlas is sort of taking this angle where we think about um, breaking tumors down or classifying them by the type of process, the mutagen, the, um, the event that, that, that screwed things up to begin with, the external event. Um, what kind of tissue uh, or cell of, that was, was altered? You know, what, what, did, what was it that's the starting state that we began with in, uh, in, um, that, 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 was the, that represented the normal cell? And then, of course, the, the pathways that are impacted by those assaults. And um, if we can uh, you know, put tumors on this sort of axis, then you know, we could maybe um, address some of these important questions about the um, biology and about um, clinical treatment of these things. And so one, I guess one way to view this, right, would be suppose you had, um, uh, you know, drug sensitivity information or predicted, let's say you mapped your um, classifiers from cell lines onto this and could map it onto this space. It would be, be awesome if we had this kind of full uh, uh, picture of, of tumor biology, we could kind of, so red here would be um, sensitive that you're going to have a response. And so um, if you have a particular patient, we, we would know, for example, that all, the, all these different types of cells, no matter what the oncogenic process was, would respond to this particular treatment, right? This would be a, an awesome um, computational model to have in hand. And then we could use this to, to match and uh, sub uh, patients tumors to, and then use them to predict treatment. So how do we get a, a view on, on the different types of cells, the different um, that, that are impacted by tumors, and the different types of um, forms that cancer comes in? We, we embarked on this um, in TCJ a couple years to collect all this data across, at that point, 12 tumor types um, uh, to answer this question, and, and a lot of different um, um, data sets um, to weigh in on, on how these tumor samples related. And so, sorry, I keep flipping back and forth, but um, you know, every, every individual um, uh, platform, the, the people that collected it kind of clustered it their own way and then got different groupings for the samples. But I guess the thing to appreciate is the colors here show you the, uh, the, the type of cancer, and usually that's the tissue of origin. And um, <clears throat> no matter what, what platform we, we, we used, um, including integrated platforms, we always got sort of the same answer that the cell of origin is driving the, the cancer. And you could see this um, you know, um, fairly well in some of these clusters that we built using a method that Katie Holdley developed called cluster of clusters, where you're just clustering the, the, the memberships that you get from the individual platforms. <clears throat> um, and so we've been, uh, and we have a, at UCSC, we have a sort of a, a browser to look at these things. This is what we call the tumor map. 
And in this, um, you can see the tissues, color, that's what the colors show you. And um, for the most part, uh, you know, 90% of the tumors kind of map with one that's like themselves. <clears throat> um, you could, you could ins you know, further inspect this map, look at the subtypes. Um, that, and so a lot of this, um, the subtypes have, are preserved in, in, these, in the mRNA maps, at least, which is shown here, like breast cancers. You can see the different subtypes, luminals, um, shown in blue, or the basals. Um, there's endometrials versus serous um, uh, um, uterine cancers. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of the uh, GBM subtypes are uh, somewhat teased out by these, by these global maps and so forth. Um, we can also make these maps out of uh, other types of data besides mRNA data, right? If you look at the DNA methylation data, then you can see, for example, in the colorectal area, you can see these hypermutated, uh, hyper instable tumors that lead to more mutations um, due to this um, mismatch repair uh, defect in those tumors. So, uh, I guess one of the interesting stories here that, that um, was, at this point, was for the bladder cancers. Um, they showed this cross tumor mapping um, that was happening. So um, there was kind of convergence and divergence. So most of the bladders were mapping on their own here, but then some were sort of bundled with the squamous tumors. And um, that was a key uh, insight because, it, it, you know, uh, to the pathologist, these did not look like squamous tumors. So the, the molecular data was more sensitive. And in fact, those tumors that map to the squamous areas, that's shown here versus the bladder, Island one that I showed you previously have a have a different um, out, uh, different patient outcomes. So this suggests that if you know if we can take this information and get it to the clinics, get it to the doctors' hands, that they could then think about the treatment of these patients differently. You know, not like a, a, a run of the mill bladder cancer, but probably something more like uh, what what is caused by uh, smoking and so forth um, that are, that are shared with the, the squamous tumors. Um, so I hinted that we have a, a, a new project, the PanCan Atlas and TCGA. <clears throat> We've collected 33 different types of, of tumor types. Um, there's 11,000 samples now, so this is sort of doubling the size as far as patients go of this collection. Um, and, uh, and of course, a lot more tumor types, almost triple the number. And the, the maps now kind of look like this, so we have a lot more sort of cross um, tumor connections possibly going on, um, and you know, for example, the bladder cancers are um, mapping at various different places. As we add more examples of different types of tumors, um, we can get a higher resolution on on the different um, on the different possible um, connections between these tumor types. So I'm excited that we're um, going to find some interesting things in this in this next six months as we analyze this data. Um, in TCJ, so um, this is just to show you. So uh, you know, I showed you that like one in ten um, tumors are sort of mapping to places we didn't anticipate, like the bladder cancer example. Um, you know, even though nine out of ten um, did, one out of ten aren't, and that's quite a quite a number of people. And I think in this in this next map, you know, that that we've doubled, we're getting more like one in five. So um, I think this is starting to reach the point where it's going to. Um, you know, uh, be, be very, very helpful for, um, for, for the use um, in precision medicine. So as an example, so just remember, this is just using, um, you know, what um, type of cancer you have, what kind of subtype. So the idea here is to take this map, um, this reference map we have, and then take a new patient's tumor and map it in there and see if it tells us anything interesting. And we've embarked on this at UCSC um, in this project we call Treehouse. And so the idea here is to take um, uh, data from children, um, pediatric um, oncology um, samples. Um, you know, at this point that we did it, we only had a few of these um, uh, uh, cases. And um, you know, usually they'll treat treat the kids with heavy doses of radiation and chemotherapy because uh, I mean, the kids can take it; they're pretty hardy. Um, and they usually respond, but when they don't, they don't really, you know, there's, there's, they're kind of at a loss for what to do next. There's not as much known about pediatric cancer. And so the idea was to take the, the adult cancers from TCJ and sort of use them as a backdrop, a backdrop to look up the molecular profiles of the kids' cancers and see what it tells us um, in, in, in collaboration with these clinical trials. Um, 
And so the white dots here are, are the places that these, these pediatric cancer samples mapped in the PANCAN 33 map at the time, <clears throat> um, showing you some of the interesting cases. You know, oftentimes we'll get, um, you know, a tumor will map to, to an area where we expected, like a neuroblastoma will go to a neuroblastoma and so forth, or a squamous cell carcinoma will go to the squamous area. But then there were some cases, <clears throat> like this sarcoma here, that was also mapping to a neuroblastoma. Um, and so we had a few of these interesting cases, or, or this one was a neurofibroma that was mapping to ERBB-driven breast cancer. I'm just going to kind of skim through that one. So th um, this case um, was followed up on a little more, so I wanted to focus the talk a little bit on it. Um, <clears throat> the sarcoma that goes in neuroblastomas. What we, what we noticed um, in that area in the network was that, that um, these neuroblastomas, the gray um, hexagons, um, all shared this ALK fusion. And so I, ALK fusions I, first found in lung cancers um, were, were shown to respond to this drug drizotinib, which is an ALK inhibitor. And then they, they um, subsequently were able to use it for these neuroblastomas, um, th where the neuroblastomas also had ALK fusion. Um, so we don't know the fusion status for this particular patient. Um, so, but we could look up the ALK expression level um, of, of ALK um, amplified uh, tumors and so forth and sort of compare um, the expression level that we're seeing in this, in this patient sample. And it was um, a, an elevated level in this particular sample. It's at the, it's at the level of, of what you see in the ALK amplified or the ALK fusion tumors. Um, and so the doctor actually acted on this and gave the kid um, crizotinib and um, the, most of the Mets shrunk, not all of them, and I, it gave the doctor a clue on, uh, on what next to do. Um, uh, they they um, chose um, this alternative pathway, JAK-STAT, to ALK. Um, um, they also gave them a, this JAK-STAT inhibitor, so this just shows you the diagram, the alternative pathway through JAK-STAT signaling that can bypass ALK inhibition. Here's ALK. Um, so, so that, um, and, and then I, the, it's so far, um, you know, last report is this, that this um, patient is doing well, kind of using both the, uh, this crizotinib and then um, alternating with this JAK-STAT inhibitor. So this is my one example that I know so far where we can take the, this reference map, look up a, 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 a particular, you know, N of one case and um, where it's um, been followed up on. And we've, we've now been invited, um, uh, to participate in this California Institute of Precision Medicine to, to expand on this and to try this systematically um, instead of just um, ad hoc like I showed you. So, I mean, now that we know that, you know, that, that cancers come in these different forms and they, they reflect their, their, their cells of origin, um, and, and, and this data is not, not only reflected by the, 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 um, the data types I showed you, but also um, People have shown that um, you know mutations, both the both the number of mutations in different tissues shown along here, the spectra, like the type of, uh, of of particular variants that you have have a have a certain um, uh, reflect the tumor of origin. Like here's your um, um, melanomas up here with the UV signature and so forth. Um, but more than that, um, if you look at the you know inside the genomes, at the epigenomes, and where the mutations are lining up. They tend to line up in the, in the, you get more mutations in the heterochromatin, the regions that are um, not as accessible, in this case, by the, the, DNA, um, the DNA enzyme. Um, and, and, and folks have shown that it correlates with the open, closed chromatin status, which is sort of wired into the, the, the normal tumor. So this was sort of an interesting result from uh, the Broad Institute, part of the epigenetics roadmap um, that came out. Um, where you could see that um, if, you, if you look at where the um, mutations are ganging up, they, they reflect their, t their tissue of origin, their normal um, tissue of origin, right? So the um, melanoma um, samples would, would gang up in the, in, the open, uh, in the closed domains of the, the melanocytes and so forth, and um, pretty much without fail that happened. And then one other, one, one other interesting um, uh, result that they showed, which I'm not showing here, is that if you look at the domain structure of the, the tumors, they, they don't correlate with where the mutations are. So it's the normal cell state um, that predicts where the uh, mutations will, will occur. So again, that reflects the cell of origin 
Um, and you can, cl you can further classify these things. So Lincoln, um, Stein, and um, Katie Holy have taken the results of the whole genome analysis from ICGC, and you can sort of start classifying tumors just based on, on where these mutations um, wind up in the genomes. Okay, so, so this, this shows us that we can, um, that we can uh, um, you know, sort of take uh, data sets, either mutations or um, expression data or um, methylation state, and sort of identify what, what type of cancer we have. And so that, that's, that's the first part of the story. So the second part is, you know, what do we do um, with the, you know, the particular oncogenic events that happen? So, um, you know, if you're looking for which mutation, there's passengers and drivers, and we want to figure out what, what are the, um, the important mutations that, that, that uh, you know, in, in some patient sample. And, and um, my group has worked on this, but many um, others have come before to work on predicting drivers from passengers and so forth to winnow down what are the important ones. So things in the, that, that are sort of classic methods for in, um, inferring the importance of variants, like you, um, I'm sure many of you and some of you have worked on methods like this. So look at um, you know, where the mutations happen in the protein structure, if it's in a conserved area of the, of the sequence, to figure out if it's important. And these are, were borrowed from you know, um, germline analysis, but have carried over into looking at somatic mutations as well. You can look at the frequency of these events across a lot of different um, patients. You know, more mutations may, are, you know, is, it could be an indication that um, it's a, an important event, especially if it, there's recurrent events you know, in the same exact position. Um, like in BRAF, you always have that V600E variant and so forth. Um, uh, and then whether it gangs up in pathways. So, you know, Ben Raphael's group and, and um, has um, pioneered some of this work to look at um, how those mutations correlate with, with, with known or predicted pathways. Um, and seeing also um, whether the genes are um, in these mutual exclusive relationships across patients, since um, that, that can also be a signature that they're, they're in the same pathway. So, um, the, the one limitation is that these sort of predict at the gene level which genes are important, um, which ones are getting mutated, right? You want to know for a particular patient, okay, they've got um, a retinoblastoma or a p53 mutation. Is it is that a, that could, it could be a, dry, a passenger event, or but is there evidence that it's actually important in this patient's tumor? Sometimes, um, sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And um, so one method that we've um, developed in the lab is called, um, that takes, uh, make, takes advantage of our pathway analysis that I didn't talk about here, um, that, that's called paradigm, that sort of it will infer the activities of a whole bunch of genes in a pathway diagram that you give it from integrated data. Um, but what the student did was, um, um, was take that, um, those um, predictions and then ask for a particular gene that might be mutated um, uh, we can look downstream at the effects of, uh, in this particular patient and see if, if, if the pathway um, levels look lower um, than what you expect from the upstream regulators, let's say. So we kind of do two types of pathway analysis, one where we disconnect the parents and one where we disconnect the children. And then we look and see if the pathway inferences give you a discrepancy for this particular gene in this particular patient. Um, and, and, um, the, the student called this the shift score, so we call it paradigm shift. And um, uh, we've published quite a few different um, uses of this in TCJ papers, and so this is an example of, a, of an example in an, in an oncogene where you can see that this paradigm shift level by comparing the upstream and the downstream levels um, would expect to see that there's higher activity downstream than you expect from the regulators, and so it's inferring this gain of function um, for the most part in this, in this particular um, gene in, in lung squamous cancers. And so you could go for, forward and kind of run paradigm shift on a whole bunch of, of, of genes and, and then sort of implicate whether it's active or inactive, even if you have a few number of examples. That's sort of the point of the red font here, that we don't need to look at recurrence or frequency. You sort of gain power by looking at the pathway neighborhood of these things, even in one particular patient. So there are um, other methods coming out, thankfully, to, to try to help us infer which which of these, um, which, which of these um, events are, are important. You can see we also ran this in several different tumor types. Um, this is, again, NFU2L2. The mutations are shown, um, the mutated um, 
uh, NFE2L2 tumors are right here in this little section where, uh, where the black um, um, uh, wedge is right here. And so you can see that it's inferring gain of function for those cases. Um, we've sorted this by tumor type. And you can see that there's other examples where, you know, for example, where I'm pointing here, where the method inferred gain of activity in NFE2L2, but there are no mutations. And so um, one interesting thing we did is we, could, we sort of used this as a sieve to scan for other events that correlate with that prediction. So what else may be causing NFE2L2 gain of function if it's not an NFE2L2 mutation? Um, and so we could sort of correlate all these other events um, with that predicted activity. And um, so what I'm showing you here is this other mut uh, mutation in a different gene, KEEP1. And that's an example of, a, of another gene that actually interacts with NFE2L2. And that's sort of the, one of the most correlated, um, positively correlated um, events that's going on in this, in this pan cancer data set with NFE2L2. So we can use this to sort of expand our knowledge, find other events that we may not know about that, that sort of correlate with with um, ones that we do. Yes, Paul? factory receptors on that list scare the pants off of you? Um, uh, some, yeah, some of these do, like this one, olfactory receptor. And, right, the orgs, well, um, at, so, at some point, we, yeah, the, there's a cutoff that you have to impose on the, on the uh, significance of this. So, um, you know, you know if I, whether I'm confident in NP1 being anti-correlated with it or, or Call three is actually a known one, right? Yeah, I mean we're still working on you know where is this thing, and it's definitely um, worth considering you know where to draw that line, and certainly olfactory receptors are a concern. Um, so, so turning toward what we're going to do about inferring this this model for a patient, right? I've, I've often shown this sort of this cartoon, um, and and thankfully now we, we we've embarked on this, and I get to show you some real data. Um, uh, that we've that we've had the privilege of working on recently, so if I if I have the the set of mutations I think are driving, let's say, are important for a patient, and again I, I we have some representation of the subtype of this patient, then then the idea is to try to fill in what is the the diagram this this pathway model we could use to think about what happened in this cancer, how to treat it, and so forth. <clears throat> um, so for the first part, we've sort of taken inspiration from Andrea Califano's group. We can run you know, their marina analysis where you infer the transcription factors that are activated from a gene expression signature. So once you have a, you know, a particular subtype of cancer may have a transcriptional profile that, that um, highly, um, is, is, is highly predictive of that subtype, then what we do is we, we infer the transcription factors or their combinations of transcription factors. That, um, that seem to be driving that tumor. So that gets us um, you know, up one level and toward connecting up things from the genomic mutations to, the, to what we see um, sort of more phenotypically at the expression level. Um, and, and, and then so then we still have to kind of, kind of fill in this gap. And um, we took inspiration from, again, from Ben Raphael's HotNet algorithm. So we, we um, published a method called tie-dye, which takes in um, different sets of, of data um, from a particular patient or a subtype, and it builds a network that connects those using um, network diffusion. So if you have two different sets, you have here, let's say we have the mutations or other types of um, um, alterations, epigenetic or genetic, um, and then um, um, activated transcription factors, then um, you can use a diffusion process to um, find those genes that interlink those two sets. And so we call these the linker genes if they weren't in your starting set. And the tie-dye network sort of is, combines both the, the, um, the, the things that you started with, the sources and targets with those linkers. Okay, and we've shown that if you use these, this, um, uh, this diffusion process where you have multiple sets diffusing and you look for their intersection, that you, you gain precision over finding actual true linkages in networks compared to some decoy links that we put in there. Um, sorry to put HotNet on, on, this, on this graph, but it's getting lower, but it, HotNet is sort of the, the single diffusion approach there, and we're gaining the power by looking for the intersection of sort of multiple HotNet processes when we use, use tie-dye. Um, 
So that can get us um, sort of you know, a, a way to fill in um, the mutations to these activated transcription factors. Um, and so our question was um, whether this, this, this reflected real biology, these linker genes. And so we connected up with um, Justin Drake and Owen Witte's lab at UCLA. Um, um, uh, so Owen Witte's an HHMI investigator at UCLA, and they had collected a lot of different um, phosphoproteomic states um, for 8,000 of these peptides um, in, uh, in several prostate cancer samples. And so what we could do is uh, uh, take um, um, data from, from mutations in these prostate cancer samples, and we could take um, uh, the expression data, kind of build a, a network, and then ask whether the linker genes are, can, are, are also found as um, um, activated um, uh, kinases in these networks that we're looking at. And so if you, if you build the tie-dye network from, um, from the, the you know, TCJ expression data for these for, uh, and from um, some of the stand-up to cancer um, patient data that we had for metastatic versus, versus non-metastatic disease, um, and we'd see you know, this, this enrichment for the linker genes have a shift in activity, right? So if you look up the, um, the kinase activity of the things that are linkers and compare them to things that weren't getting linked into the tie-dye networks, we see a, a good sign that, that um, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a positive trend for the, those things being included are, are actually coming out in the, in, the, in, the, in the proteomic screen. You could also kind of ask the reverse. Um, you know, if, so we can infer the activity of transcription factors with things like Marina. We could also infer the activity of kinases from, from the phosphoproteomics data as well by using, um, you know, a Califano-like method again, where instead of taking the, the, transcription, the transcription data and looking at targets of transcription factors, we could take the proteomics data and look at a kinase and ask, is it, does the kinase seem to be getting activated? So this is kind of an example if you looked at the AKT's levels, um, right? So, you know, you can imagine looking at all the phosphoproteomics data and seeing that, okay, this gene, this kinase here, PRKA2, is, is implicated because uh, many of its targets it's act, uh, that, that it's um, predicted to activate are also phosphorylated, and the ones that it's supposed to not, not phosphorylate are also not phosphorylated in the, in the data. And so... Um, uh, we see, you know, this is sort of a slight enrichment, 0.01, but we do see a slight enrichment for, um, you know, the, the, the activated kinases inferred from this marina-like method are nearby the activated transcription factors in these tie-dye solutions, right? If you run it many times with permutations on this kind of thing or you compare it to um, a background set, then, then we, we're seeing a, a subtle enrichment here, which is also, also good news. Okay, so... So what we can do is, what, what our idea is, we can take, since the proteomics data seems like it's relating to the expression data, what we can do is try to build uh, an overall network from all this data using tie-dye again, where we give it mutations, expression, proteomics, and we can build what we call the scaffold network for metastatic prostate cancer. <clears throat> um, and then um, it's a huge network, so you can kind of go through and summarize what this network looks like by looking at hallmarks and their enrichment. So this wheel just kind of shows you what um, pathways are getting bundled in with that. I'm going to kind of speed up. I guess I'm out of time here. Um, the proteomics data sort of enriches for many different pathways over not using it, except for a couple here. Even though we lost some enrichment here, it's still, it still is significantly enriched. OK, so now that we have this scaffold network, this just gives you an overview of some of the processes in, the, in here. And we've seen correlation with. Um, in METs, um, these genes that are in these pathways are, are more active than in non-METs. Just some biological follow-up, functional follow-up on that. So finally, um, now that we have a scaffold network, what we can do is we take an individual patient's you know, mutations and their data, and, and then we take in the scaffold network, run tie-dye again to get sort of this patient-specific network. And again, you can also look at the hallmarks of that patient-specific network. Um, this is sort of what it looks like, right? We, we, you have a pretty complicated overview, a view of this is for one particular patient, um, patient 40. So let me just maybe show an example. Like if you hone in on, on those things that relate to cell cycle, um, you know, this, this diagram tells you this patient has a loss of heterozygosity in AP, APC, like a deletion and mutation. Um, that could impact the, uh, it also has an amplification in these chromatin, remo this chromatin remodeler. Um, 
Uh, and then, sorry, that's, a, um, tr that's inferred, uh, yeah, an amplification in, in, in EZH2. Um, this, there, uh, the, these chromatin remodelers were inferred to be activated and so forth. This is sort of what the, the diagram looks like. So um, to, to cut to the chase, um, you know, we've done this for several patients now, and we've had to think about, well, what in those networks do you, can you choose as the targets? And so we tried to topologically sort these, um, these regulators that we're finding, and this is supposed to show you the tree. It didn't come all the way out, but now we, we have this diagram that we can kind of go through and, and say, well, you could target AKT1 if it's activated or anything underneath it's activated. Um, if you want to, if you think it's going to be, um, if, then, then you might also target SARC and AKT and so forth to try to cover most of this network. It's sort of a network cover problem. So that's sort of where we're at now. I'm, I'm out of time. We're, we're now uh, actually following up on some of the implicated um, um, uh, components of these networks to, to think about combinations and testing those in cell line models. So um, the take home messages were, you know, we can find these forms hopefully with, with pan cancer analysis. There's some surprises there about mapping to cross tumor examples. And this is set to increase since we're, we've doubled the map. Um, I showed you an example where, the, where it even helps you, even that stage helps you pick possible um, new treatment avenues for, the, for pediatric cancers. And um, finally, we're trying to um, put together these, the, this, um, uh, you know, so a, a hierarchy of what to target for a particular patient so we can kind of come up with these rational combinations. So um, this is my, my group um, and, uh, that, that did um, a lot of this work, and, and it's also performed in the context of the, the cancer genomics group um, run by David Hausler and myself, and, and we collaborate with, with Chris Benz at the Buck. So I will stop there. I, I went a minute over, and, and I apologize. Thanks. So, uh, lovely talk, fantastic. So, can you explain the um, the map? What Which is, one? What is the dimensionality of the oh, the map? yeah, the tumor map. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say anything about it. Uh, yeah, each of those hexagons was a tumor sample, and they got positioned based on similarity in in the underlying data. So, if you compare their transcriptomes, there's some similarity or correlation, and you can just do kind of these spring embedding types of, of layouts in two dimensions, and then we just snap it to this hexagonal grid. And then we, the, the browser that we're set to publish on um, is, it, it's, we just use Google Maps. And you can load a bunch of data in there. You can browse it just like Google Maps. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't say what the hell that was. Well, question. I have one. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned this case with the ARC and JAK stuff where uh, two alternative pathways that you know, treat in that one case. Right. Is that something you're trying to point out in this analysis? That yeah. Um, well, so yeah, ultimately we're going to have. I think that is something that the, the, the treating physician decided to do, right? There, right. right. Well, we're, we, yeah, I, I, my computational lab is not going to sit sit down and say, you know, treat this and then that. You know, we're, what we want to do is bring this information to the tumor board meeting. Um, you know, the, there'll be other, so, you know, it'll be one of the things brought up when they do the, the genomics um, workup of that tumor, right? We can say, you know, the pathway results indicate you could treat this patient with, you know, SARC, uh, right? Like, so if you're, I showed you guys patient 40, I guess, right? And they have activated AKT or predicted or, or PDC. So you, if you've got, and some of these have drugs known for them, so you, we could treat with this AKT inhibitor. Um, and if we were worried about, you know, check two get also, you know, getting turned on, we could pick either a CDK1 or a SARC in combination with that. This, so I'm hoping we have some kind of diagram like this that could be helpful for reasoning through the combinations that you could use. <laughs> Follow up to, <coughs> to the same question. So, in this tumor board meeting, is yeah. is the computational representative? Yeah. Involved? Yeah. There. So there, we get one, basically one person that is the per, that is the consultant from the the computational workup of this thing. But um, they're also there with the. Um, 
you know, the clinical researcher that we collaborate with to, to help us sort of translate um, our, our findings to make it understandable to the, to the doctors. Definitely. Okay. So I guess I have one question about the sort of the marina analysis. Yeah. So what what is this gain for you? Like, does it? That's a good question. It does, yeah. I think it, it you know, the we we you've got this big transcriptional profile, and um, it it does reduce the dimensionality. I think probably in a in a useful way. It's probably not the best way to do it, but it, it it's probably helping to clean up some of the noise that that's in there, um, and and honing in on some dominant signal. Maybe it helps you get at the the major subclone. I, I don't. I'm not sure why. Um, you know why it helps other you know, for right now it is sort of a mathematical convenience that we're using it just to summarize the transcriptional data but I think that's a good question and and possibly a limitation because it, does it rely on known targets or to have some notion of known targets um, somewhat not not fully I mean you can um, you can kind of give it a regulon it can it can infer a regulon a little bit as well by looking at correlated activities of predict of some other targets it can kind of pull it into the to the regulon but yeah it is it, it, it is um, biased by a known biology okay, that's, Great question. Let's do more questions after uh, the, the thank you